Praise God. Isn't it good to worship the Lord and be together, even if it's in spirit, because that's the main thing. If any two or three will gather in his name, there he is in the midst of them. And you know, wherever Jesus shows up, signs and wonders happen. Great things happen. So I'm so excited. This is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. I've got some special treats for you today. So I want to jump right into it. Let's just welcome the Holy Spirit because we never want to take for granted the access we have to His presence. Precious Holy Spirit, we just welcome you right now in our lives, in our churches, in our homes, in our cars, if we're listening on the radio, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. And we ask you, Lord, to breathe on the seed of God's Word. Let it find its mark, and our lives will never be the same again as we receive the incorruptible seed of God's Word. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So just quickly now, we've been talking about why we worship and a quick little review is we learned that last time in part two that worship can be weaponized and Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. So we can use worship as a continuation of Jesus, King Jesus' victory at the cross to employ his victory here on earth. Man, I said that so good, didn't I? Right? So as a worshiper, we're armed with the spirit and truth so that the enemy has to run. Look, James says this, resist the devil and he will flee. How do you resist the enemy? I'm going to tell you, one of the number one weapons you can use is worship. No enemy can stand against the manifest presence of God. And let me tell you, when you truly worship God, God shows up. You could be in a prison cell. God shows up. Paul and Silas did that. They began singing hymns, not because they felt like it, but God showed up, shook the prison. Everybody was walking out free. Talk about freedom. And we know this when we're talking about weaponized worship against the enemies of God. Ephesians 6, 12 says this, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of wickedness and darkness and high places. So our enemies are invisible. And I said this the last time, the invisible is the critical. We're called to walk by faith, not by sight. So we see some of us for the first time that true worship is weaponized against the enemy. Now we're getting into part three, the power of worship. Worship in and of itself has no power. It's kind of like when you pick up a big, heavy electrical cord. The cord in and of itself has no power, but it is a transfer agent. So what I'm talking about is the outcome of properly connecting to the source of all life and love. True worshipers doing true worship. That's what we do. We connect to Father God's presence and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. So when I say the power of worship, I'm saying I'm talking about the power made available when we humbly acknowledge and magnify God, the outcome of God's presence. So in this part, what we're about to learn is we're going to discover from the meaning of worship that there's safety and intimacy in the real word for worship. And also in this session, we're going to learn that true worship has a refining power to it, the power of worship. So I wanted some extra special people to help me here today just so that we can do this job right. So I got three of my favorite worship experts, my beautiful wife, Miss Pam. <laughs> Pam, you've been writing songs and leading worship since you've been three years old. Yeah, just you not. got like a little bit of experience, right? A little bit of experience leading worship. Yeah. And I mean, you've traveled all over the world leading people in worship. And I'm not just talking music. I know you're musical, but even just in life, I've seen you um, on the phone with somebody who is dying. They're like five minutes from leaving this. I'm sorry, am I getting you crying already? <laughs> but five minutes from leaving this world and I've seen you get on the phone and I've watched you sing them into the very presence of God. Girl, you are a worshiper and you know it. And then two more of my most favorite worshipers on planet yes. Earth are Eloy and Stephanie Martinez. You know, you guys have been enjoying them leading in worship and they've been doing such a phenomenal job in such a difficult circumstance. But, you know, I knew they could do an excellent job because they really have a heart for worship. I've, I know their personal lives. I know their, the things that they've been through and how that they, even in their deepest struggles, use worship, both for the blessing of it, 
the outcome of it and for the weaponized side of it to deal with the enemy's um, stuff. So I just want to say thank you guys for being yeah, here. Our pleasure. our pleasure. Thank you for We're going to have some fun? Yeah. yeah. Let's have some fun. Yeah. <laughs> we can have some fun. Uh, so you guys, here's what I want to start with. The, the Hebrew meaning for the word worship. You guys know I like to go a little bit of Hebrew every once in a while. And so I thought worship is such an important thing. Let's go right to the heart of the matter. The Hebrew word for when we say the word worship. And here's what it is. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it exactly right, but I think it's close. It's shaka. And it's made up of three Hebrew letters, and it basically means to bow down, to fall flat in reverence. And the Hebrew word shaka is made up of these three letters that has in those letters the letter he. And anytime the letter he is used, it means outstretched arms, ready to receive and to behold, to pay attention to what follows. Is that not interesting? Oh, yeah. You use the word worship, and if it's really true worship, there's got to be a sense of what follows. And you guys have heard me many times when I've been um, even just kind of encouraging our worship leaders before we go out and do a service or something like that. I'm always saying we worship here. It may be a Sunday, maybe doing a Sunday service. And I'll always tell the worship team, but what are you believing God for Monday? Tuesday. What are you expecting? Because God can't just show up in reality and nothing happen. That would be vain. That would be futile. That's not the real thing. So let's take a look at just talking about that letter, hey, in the word for worship. Can we look at, and I get some help from maybe Pam, can you read Psalm 63 verse 4? So will I bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. So Really, it's, it's part of a heavenly instruction, isn't it? Like lifting up our hands, worshiping God. I kind of think of it like this, like a little child. And Stephanie, I've seen your little boy come up to you, Josiah. And when he lifts his hands, I know what that means. That means, you know, like, pick me up. Person who loves me, who's way bigger than me, pick me up and love on me even more intensely. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, I love that. Paul wrote this to his protege in 1 Timothy 2.8. He said, therefore, I want men to pray everywhere by lifting up hands that are holy. Uh, you know, it's just, it's built into our experience when it comes to worship, that letter, hey, that third letter, hey, Open wide the arms, lift them up heavenly, and believe God for the outcome that follows the worship. So built into the word for worship is an expectation. Outstretched arms and upward reverence while bowing down low. And there is also built into that word for worship safety. I love that. The inner sanctuary. You see, when we practice praise and worship, we come into God's inner sanctuary where God reveals himself. And that's where I was talking about. Paul and Silas knew this. It wasn't like some kind of trick. They knew in the presence of the Lord, there's freedom. There's the, Bars can't hold you back. So worship is not necessarily singing or musical. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. But something great always follows. It always comes after when you engage in in true worship, true shaka. There I go, all my Hebrew self. So Eloy, I want you to talk about this because me and you, we've shared many coffees and lunches and we've talked about God's power in your life. Give, give me just a little anecdote of you practicing true worship and seeing what follows. Wow, well, I grew up, I've been blessed to grow up, you know, around worship. I remember just as a little boy going into my grandma's house and she would be weeping at the table. And I, I was wondering, Grandma, what are you doing? She's not, she's like, I'm not crying. I'm just worshiping God. And her, one of her favorite songs was, and he walks with me and he talks with me. He tells me I am his own, right? And so moments like that throughout life, I, I just reflect on, you know, grandma just in her quiet time at the coffee table, just really focusing on her creator. And there was a time in my life where I needed to do the same. You know, I had made some poor choices in life, as many of us sometimes do. Um, but, you know, thank God that he redeems, that that doesn't define us. But at that time, you know, I felt alone. I felt like, man, how do I get through this desert? And, you know, the enemy was trying to tell me that, you know, you made so many bad choices. You can't get up from this. You're, you're going to be alone. And so... It was before I met Steph, and that time just seemed real deserty, you know, real, seemed real barren, and the, I just 
but I could hold on to what I was brought up with and just, I knew that resonated in my heart to just sing a song. It doesn't matter what song it was, but if I sang it unto the Lord, he honored it. It's simple as, uh, you know, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice, you know. Uh, one, of my, um, one of my friends wrote a song, and I don't even know if he knows this, but during that time, I would sing this song that he wrote called, I love you, Lord, your praises fill my heart. And I would sing that to the Lord. And uh, at that time, when I would, before Steph, I was praying for my wife because I knew I wasn't meant to be alone. As the enemy was trying to tell me, you're, you know, you're going to be alone. You're not. You're not worthy of anymore. And so I would sing that song, I love you, Lord. And as I was singing that, the Lord was like, you know, you singing it unto me is like you singing it unto your new bride. So that really encouraged my heart. So I would sing that. I even remember, I think I, I texted to you. I sang it to, mm -hmm. in the phone where we're dating. And I sent that to her because it was a song that kind of ministered to me. Just a simple chorus. Um, but singing that really got me through, you know, one touch of God's favor could part the Red Sea and give me dry ground. Mm -hmm. So I was really excited for that. And um, then I know I didn't have to be alone. His presence where God says he's with us, right? Mm -hmm. Where two or three are gathered. And if he's always with us, we got two automatically. So he's always with us. So that, that really helped me through that time in my life. And it's just been um, an encouragement step. And I try to lead that in my home, um, yeah, show my family, my daughters that, hey, no matter what you're going through, sing a song. Sing over your situation. And uh, God will God will uh, he'll open the doors and show you the way. I'm reminded we went to... Um, we went up to the mountains this past weekend, and so it was. And as I was looking at the forest, kind of that uh, was in the back, you know, in the light it was cool. You could see all the different terrain and the different, uh, the different stones or the stumps or the little cliff that kind of fell off. And I thought, wow, how cool! But if you started walking that that path, and it gets dark, you can't see anything. Right. And so that the Lord was quickening me like, you know, when you're walking through life, sometimes there's different terrains, there's different stumps. But if you don't have a spotlight to walk and know where you're going, it's kind of cool how the Lord designed it. The light goes before you so you can see you don't shine the light behind you. I mean, it doesn't do you any good if it's in the back. Right. But thank God that he is a light. And if you walk in his light, he'll direct your paths. And worship for me was that kind of context. That's beautiful, man. You know, I, I think of when I hear Eloy's story, I think of James 1.17 that says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. And I just get that picture again of a little boy, a little girl just reaching up their hands in worship with an expectancy. And when you reach up, you know, it's, it's so cool that the word is bow down and at the same time reach up. Mm -hmm. It's just such an interesting picture. You're bowing low, as low, the word even has like a depressed into the ground, bowing low with a sense of reaching up and expecting the goodness that follows because God is good. And when I think of Eloy's story and I think of so many um, stories in his life about that, when he would worship, God would always show up with what seemed even impossible to him, but maybe to others. But God fulfilled his word and brought the good on the other side of the worship. And although worship isn't necessarily singing, it can include music. And often it has a scripture. It really is about humbling ourselves, ascribing worth and value, and with outstretched arms looking to what follows. We got that behold from the letter, hey, if there's no sense of behold, you strip the Hebrew word of a whole third of its meaning. You completely neuter the word and it's no longer worship. So we will not do that around here, right? We're going to keep it real or go home. So something of God always follows when you engage in true worship, true shaka. Remember, we talked about King Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 20. When they really began to sing, not only were their enemies destroyed, but they were three days picking up the spoil. When Abraham bowed down before the Lord, man, Sarah got pregnant at 90 years old. I don't want to scare any of you older people, but I'm telling you, worship, something good follows. Hannah, she bowed before the Lord God in the temple and she got her supernatural miracle. So countering that, you guys, with what I call religious pretentious nothingness worship, Say that three times. <laughs> Say that three times. Well, let's, let's listen to what Jesus says. Stephanie, would you read Mark 7, verse 7? 
Sure. In vain, fruitlessly, and without profit do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments and precepts of men. You guys, we got to remember, that was Jesus talking, talking about religious people. And this is why I say, you know, I'm, even though I'm a minister, pastor, you know, I, I've, I've been in the ministry for years, I'm not religious. I don't like religion because the thing is, look at Jesus here, in vain, fruitlessly, without profit. He actually word, used the prophet word, yeah. talking about worship. Do they worship me? Teaching his doctrines, the commandments and precepts of men. Look, God doesn't get any pleasure out of vain worship. You know what that means, what vain worship is? Worship that doesn't do anything, doesn't go anywhere. There's nothing following. If you've got a Sunday and everybody pot and panning it and everybody's excited and yeah Jesus you know and all that kind of thing but there's nothing Monday right. you, you weren't worshiping the Lord mm -hmm. I, I know that's a really heavy indictment but something always happens when God shows up right. it has to or else God is not God right mm -hmm. right so um Eloy would you read Isaiah 45 verse 19 you bet I did not call the descendants of Jacob to a fruitless service saying Seek me for nothing, but I promise them a just reward. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, the truth, trustworthy, straightforward correspondence between deeds and words. I declare things that are right. You guys look at that. I did not call basically the children of God to a fruitless service saying, hey, you know, seek me for nothing. And yet it's so strange. Worship leaders, you guys have heard the same thing I have. Worship leaders get up and in between songs, come on, everybody, let's just worship the Lord. Let's not expect anything. Let's just worship him for who he is. And it's like, what? It's like worship him for who he is, but let's expect nothing. Right. We just said James 1, 17, God, the father of lights in whom every perfect good and perfect gift comes right. down from heaven mm -hmm. and yet let's worship him that God mm -hmm. who gives us the very air we're breathing and making your heart beat but can we just worship him and expect absolutely nothing and I think that would on be honorable yeah. it's a contradiction it is totally it's craziness you guys and yet without God's word directing us into the true meaning of worship it's so easy to slip and fall into this accidental form of worship that seems good. You know, you got a quarter of a million dollar sound system. You got a great band. Maybe even let's hire some professional musicians. We're going through the motions. People are waving their hands in the air like they just don't care. But guess what? Nothing is happening Monday. I, I find it intolerable. I can't stand it. I don't know about you. I just can't. If we're going to worship God Almighty, it is an attack against His identity to expect Nothing. Mm -hmm. God never in any place in his word says, seek me or worship me for nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you're just singing for others to hear how good you sound, mm -hmm. it's empty. It's useless. If you're lifting your hands in the church to be noticed and considered religious, you're wasting your life and your energy. If you're doing service for God as a sacrifice, here's a good one. Because you feel guilty, you're distracted mm -hmm. from the obedience that God really wants you to perform, which is true worship, true shaka bowing low with your arms open to all of his goodness, the Father. And part of that goodness is grace. Eloy was talking about that. Grace that we get what Jesus deserves, not what we deserve because it's true. We make mistakes. We have failed. And so somehow to think that we've been disqualified from the goodness of God, that's where the grace comes in. But that's part of who God is. When Moses said, God, I want to see your goodness. God said, I'll make my goodness and my name pass before you. In God's name is his mercy, his grace, his kindness, his loving kindness toward us. Pam, you know a whole lot about that. And you know what it's like to be in a place where you feel like you've been disqualified from God's goodness. And somehow you're just... You're sad, you're mad, everything doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, I was, I was thinking what you were just talking about too and just going to the scripture that says without faith, it's impossible to please God, so it's impossible to worship God. So when we don't have faith, and sometimes that faith is you have to step out. I remember I was just a kid traveling with my parents or missionary evangelists and traveling all the time and just feeling kind of like, 
you know, where am I going in life? What's going to be lonely? And my parents are getting ready for a service the next day. They had us in a, like a little condo the church did. And I remember this heaviness that I'd never felt before just came over me. It was like, it felt like a blanket, like it, I could hardly breathe. It was almost like choking my lungs, you know? And uh, I just, I just felt like, oh, God help me. And I knew I was supposed to sing. I heard the words of King David, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And I was trying to sing, but nothing came out. And all of a sudden I just started out of my mouth. I started singing in the spirit. And then I just started singing, um, hallelujah, praise the lamb. And then I just wrote the next, hallelujah, praise the lamb. My heart sings his praise again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. God put those words in my mouth. I just started singing to him. As, as I was singing, minutes went by and I kept repeating it over and over. Pretty soon I was like dancing. It's not a song you really dance to, but the depression, I could breathe again. I could breathe deep and the depression left and it never came back. It was just like I chose to walk in that. The interesting thing is when God gives you a song in the night, just like he did for Eloy. It's also not just for you, but that song becomes a song to go in somebody else's mouth, to proclaim over them. And I've seen that song, that chorus, it seems to be used that people that are sad or are grief stricken or, or heavy with grief and sorrow, God seems to use that song in their life as they sing it as, unto the Lord the same way that he did it for me. That's beautiful. And you know, not only has Brooklyn Tab and other artists recorded that song that, that you wrote in that midnight hour, so to speak, but I mean, you know, th there's been people that have, like you said, have gone through tragedies that have had that song sung in their church at funerals and had a resurrection of heart and joy and soul in their, their minds, their hearts, bringing their family together when they felt like completely annihilated by tragic accidents. We've heard such great testimonies and all of it because you chose to obey the Lord in a place when you felt. See, that's the thing is I want, I want people to understand this. It's got nothing to do with feelings. You know, too many times we, we think, well, I'll worship the Lord when, when all the answers, right, just kind of land on the front yard. And it's like, then I'm going to lift up a song and praise him, praise him. And it's got nothing to do with, like Paul and Silas, I don't think felt like singing and praising the Lord. They just got whooped. They didn't even get to take up an offering and they got whooped for doing the right thing. They got whooped. Did I mention that? And they got thrown in the lower prison and they just began to sing and praise in the midnight hour. And their experience of knowing the presence of God in that lowest dungeon brought freedom. And even uh, the jailer ended up coming to Christ because of that. So let's, let's just go quickly to the word for sing. You know, we're in the Hebrew mode here. So the word for he in Hebrew for sing is zemir. And it's one of those strange Hebrew words that has a dual meaning to it. It means to prune but it means to sing. In Hebrew scholars, they like to say that they believe that the duality of that meaning has to do with when you sing, when you sing unto the Lord, you actually prune away what's unprofitable mm. from your life. Oh, Isn't that powerful? So, you know, there's a lot of times, you know, and I've found this, I, I've maybe got a, a, a wrong attitude. Maybe I'm struggling with something. Maybe it's something emotional, mental. I'm dealing with bad news. And I just find when I begin to sing to the Lord, when I begin to magnify his name, all of a sudden I can sense those pruning shears come in spiritually and begin to cut away the wrong attitude, the begin bringing alignment and making what's unfruitful eliminated, but br making room for what is supposed to be fruitful in my life and the fruit of the Spirit coming out. I can feel that love, joy, and peace coming up in my heart, but that's my act of faith. You know, the greatest evidence of our faith is our worship. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the, the evidence of things not seen, but we have great opportunity when we begin to magnify the Lord for the answer, right? You may have a big problem, but when you magnify the Lord and his answers, yeah. it's an act of faith right. to practice spiritual protocol in a severe crisis. You know, it seems foolish to the mind, sense and reasons going, what are you doing? Why are you shouting hallelujah? 
when you should be screaming and you're in pain and this is awful and why me and all this kind of stuff? Why are you doing that? Why are you pulling a psalmist and going, bless the Lord, soul. Forget not all of his benefits. Bless the Lord who redeems your life from destruction. Right now you feel like your life's in a destructive mode and you're saying, bless the Lord. Look, once again, the greatest evidence of our faith is true worship. What comes out of your heart directed toward God in a trial of praise? We're going to talk about a trial of praise right now. And I want Stephanie to kind of drill down on this. But first, let me give you this verse. And I think her story will help explain it. Proverbs 27, verse 21 says this. As the refining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so let a man or a woman be in his or her trial of praise, ridding themselves of all that is base or insincere. For a man or a woman is judged by what they praise and of what they boast. Did you know that we are called to boast in the Lord? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Psalm 34 gives us permission to boast in the Lord. Yeah. We get to bless the Lord and boast in the Lord. We talk about singing having a pruning quality, but look, there is a trial of praise that acts like a hot furnace to gold that refines it and pulls out the impurities and makes the character of that person more and more and more like Christ. And Stephanie, I think you know a little bit about what I'm talking about. Just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> There are times when you have to sing when you don't feel like singing, when everything else is sitting on you like a ton of bricks. I remember when our son Josiah was born, um, there were a lot of surprises that came on that day of his birth and some of those health complications landed him in the NICU for several weeks. So he was in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I remember we would go home and then we would drive back to the hospital in the mornings and Eloy would stay with me for a few hours. Then he'd go to work and then he'd come back and spend the evening hours with me. So I was there morning till night every day. And um, it was a hard time. It was hard to watch my, my new baby struggle to eat, um, fight infection. It was, it was so draining and such an exhausting time emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I just felt so depleted. And I remember driving to the hospital one day and I was already choking back tears. So I knew it was going to be a tricky day. And while we were there in the morning, one of the specialists came in and said um, that she would recommend doing an, another test on him to see what was going on and see what was causing some complications and all that. And I was just done. Frankly, I was done. I was, my heart was so heavy with worry and I had no peace. It was, um, all I wanted to do would just melt. I was angry. I was confused. I couldn't think straight. I was just, I was a mess. Mm. And she was trying to talk to us about this test. Thankfully, she couldn't see my face because my face was telling a story. <laughs> and thankfully, my husband could read what that story was saying in that moment. And I just kind of looked at him like, I'm out. Like, I cannot talk to this lady. Get rid of her. I'm done. And so he very politely um, just said, well, let us talk it over and um, let's revisit this a little later. And he basically just got rid of her, which is what I needed him to do for me in that moment. And then she walked out and I just lost it. I started crying. I just melted down. And Eli said, honey, what's going on? What's wrong? And of course, I could have said about a hundred things that were wrong in that very moment, but um, I was I was just done. And he said, Steph, I need you to show up. And in that moment, I can't say that I was thinking very kind, wifely <laughs> thoughts towards my husband. So I'm like, what do you need? What do you mean you need me to show up? I am here morning till night, every day. I am showing up. And I was kind of ticked at him, really. And he said, you're showing up physically. I need you to show up spiritually. And even though I didn't like what he said, I knew it was true. I knew that there was um, a place in me that needed to be stepping up and, and worshiping and praying. And I just I wasn't. I just wasn't. And I was just letting that worry sit on me. And he said, Steph, I'm going to go to work. I need you to speak over our son. 
I need you to sing over our son while I'm gone. And he walked out and I scooped out my baby boy, Josiah, and I sat in the rocker with him. And I just started singing, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. And I can't say that I sang it strong and loud. I sang it quietly and through tears. But man, in that moment, circumstances didn't immediately change. We didn't go home. He didn't start eating right away. And circumstances didn't immediately change. But what did change was my perspective. Worry melted off. And the care melted away. And the anger subsided. And his presence just came into the room. And I knew that I was singing worship to him, but it's like he turned that worship into a lullaby, not just over my baby, but over me. And I found my heart in a totally different place of rest as I just lifted up my simple song of worship. Wow, that's so beautiful. You know, John 4, Jesus said the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And, you know, I, I just, I think back to what we said in part two, where God is important, He works. You might say, well, Stephen, God's always important. But there's so many times in a case like where Stephanie and Eloy were, where they had a choice. Either we make the situation, the circumstances, the prognosis, the the we make all the crisis important mm -hmm. or we make God important. See, that's what worship does. Worship makes God important in your life. You can rewrite the context, no matter if it's a hospital room, no matter if it's a prison, no matter where it is, you have the power of choice by rewriting the context of the moment to say that, no, no, in this situation, God is supreme. God is important. And Stephanie, I would love it if we're going to have you guys lead us in a, a song. We just need to practice what we've been talking about. We need to actually just do it and worship God. So they're going to lead us in a hymn to sing a song and maybe pull a Paul and Silas here. No matter, maybe you're in a, a, a sickness, you're in a, a, a dark place. But before we sing, I just want Stephanie to say a word of prayer for you, my friend, because I know some of you are going through that place where you're feeling the same thing. You're feeling angry, you're feeling hurt, you're feeling alone. And I'm going to ask her to lead us in a prayer for you. And then right as soon as she says amen, let's just go into a time of worship. Okay? Father, I thank you that you are close to the brokenhearted. I thank you that... Your word tells us that your name is a strong tower that the righteous can run into and be safe. So Father, I pray that as we lift up our praise to you, as we lift up our worship to you, that your refuge would be so real, that your presence would be so evident, that your comfort would come in and that it would dismiss all unrest, that worry would begin to melt off of us as we we begin to lift up your name, Jesus, that cares would fall away as we cast them on you and as we sing our song. Father, I pray that your worship, that, that the worship that you receive, that it would be turned into a lullaby over our hearts. Father, I thank you for your peace and for your comfort and for your sweet rest coming in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name. 